the uh, outgoing and incoming chairman of the uh, Exporters Association of Sri Lanka, uh, other members of the Governing Council, ladies and gentlemen. Let me first thank you very much for uh, giving me the privilege of being here with you uh, this evening. Uh, I think it's probably not inaccurate to say that uh, transforming our export sector is probably the most crucial economic challenge this country faces. Because without a significantly better export performance, a number of the objectives that the government and the people of this country have for themselves just will not be met. It's as simple as that. We've, President Jair Jaiwadna, I think about now, what was it, 40 years ago, um, expressed um, the, the sentiment that we have to export or perish. And that sentiment is probably even more pertinent today because of our debt dynamics, the external debt dynamics. We certainly didn't have the debt problem that we had have today at that time, but he realized it was crucial in terms of the growth and employment <coughs> objectives of the country. Today, in addition to the growth and employment objectives, we have this onerous debt problem that we have to address. And we can't really address that without a significant improvement in our export performance. Now, by way of introduction, before I get into the uh, issues related to the export sector specifically, uh, let me just give, by way of background, um, some remarks about the growth model that the government is trying to put in place. Uh, it's private sector driven, with exports and FDI as key pillars. And if I may say a few words about each of those. You know, I've been a public servant all my life, so I don't, um, I don't subscribe to the view that the uh, private sector is the panacea for all our ills. In fact, if you look around the world, you get different mixes of the private sector and the state in terms of delivering good development outcomes. But in our case, the public debt and deficit dynamics are such that the state simply cannot lead the development process. It's nothing to do with ideology. It's a purely pragmatic assertion that it has to be the private sector that has to drive the growth employment generation process in this country. Why exports and FDI as key pillars? When you have a domestic market of 21 million people with purchasing power of now almost 4,000 US dollars, you simply cannot sustain the 6% growth or more that we need to achieve by just selling into this domestic market. It's simply not possible. And why do we need 6% growth or more? We have a very aspirational society now. And it's an educated society which is exposed uh, to all the latest communications technology so people know what is available around the world and they aspire to achieve a lot of the material <coughs> benefits uh, for their families. So if we're not able to deliver that, clearly there could be tensions um, in terms of our social and political stability. So it has to be export, um, the growth in export that drives our growth, pro our growth process to the point where we can achieve the 6% plus growth that we need to meet the aspirations of our people. And FDI, simply because if you look around all over the, of Asia, which has been the most successful continent in terms of growth and export performance, whether you're as large as China or as small as Singapore, FDI has played a key role in the export transformation that has driven uh, those economies. So that's the model that the government is trying to put in place. It's doing a lot of things to sustain that model. In terms of the macroeconomic uh, policy making, there are three frameworks that are being put in place. The government has a fiscal consolidation uh, program which is intended to bring the budget deficit down to 3.5% of GDP by 2020. The central bank is putting in place a flexible inflation targeting framework which is intended to um, um, bring about monetary policy formulation which is proactive and um, uh, you know, forward looking in the sense that today's interest rate, setting the interest rate today, the full pass through effects, the transmission does not 
have full effect in the system for about 12 months. So you're setting interest rates today really for what you think inflation and the balance of payments etc are going to be in 12 months time. And in the past we've tended to do too little too late. We allowed the economy to overheat and then we would move. And this is why you get these big fluctuations in our interest rates which makes business planning very difficult. We're trying to put in place this framework which will now enable us to set, as I said, forward-looking, proactive monetary policy, which should smooth out the fluctuations in the interest rate. They will still go up and down, but they won't get these spikes and troughs that we've had in the past if we're able to do this properly. That's what we're trying to do. Equally on the exchange rate in the past, we've tried to defend an overvalued exchange rate, used, uh, depleted, uh, borrowed foreign reserves to do that, and it was really a double whammy. We would lose large amounts of foreign reserves and then eventually had a sharp depreciation at the end of that process as well. So it just doesn't make any sense. So we're trying to follow a more flexible exchange rate policy um, which will, we hope, uh, enable us to have a competitive and stable exchange rate. If you get fiscal policy and monetary policy right, then the pressure on the exchange rate comes down. So that's crucial. You have to take all three together. If you're able to do the other two well, then you won't get pressure on the exchange rate and you can have a competitive and relatively stable exchange rate, which is where we want to try to get to. So that's the macro side. And, and uh, as uh, I mean, the minister's ministry is very much in the for forefront in terms of improving the investment climate, investment promotion, trade um, facilitation and trade policy. I'll come to those uh, during the course of my remarks. So all that is coming together. So we're hopefully we're moving in the right direction in terms of macroeconomic stabilization and the, the framework is being put in place to improve the investment climate as well as the trading environment. So let me now uh, turn to the, the matter uh, at hand today and focus on the export sector and I must thank my colleagues in the Economic Research Department of the Central Bank who have helped me to put these uh, remarks together. Sustained export growth is crucial for development of Sri Lanka, particularly given the small size of its domestic economy, as I was saying, and relying on the domestic economy alone is not sufficient to enhance the growth momentum. <coughs> Sri Lanka was ahead of its regional peers in liberalizing the economy in 1977. The adoption of liberal economic policies such as private sector driven development, export debt growth and encouragement of FDI led to immediate improvements in the foreign trade and trade openness of the country. Trade openness, which was 36.4% in 1977, nearly doubled to 72.2% by 1979. While exports as a percentage of GDP, which was 18.7% in 77 increased significantly to 29.2% by 1979, just two years after opening up of the economy. Despite the turnaround seen in the immediate aftermath, aftermath of the adoption of liberal policies, Sri Lanka's international trade performance has been lackluster, regressing to levels that were seen during the pre-liberalization area. In 2015, Sri Lanka's trade openness was 36.5%. It was 36.4% in 1977. 2015, it's gone back to 36.5%. While exports relative to GDP was reduced to, exports of goods was reduced to 12.7%, having increased to 29.2% in 1979 and gone up as high as 32% in 2000. So we've gone backwards. And we were back almost to where we were in 1977 in terms of trade performance. Although the common notion is that there is a bi-directional relationship between export growth and economic growth, this relationship has not been seen in relation to Sri Lanka. This was especially experienced between 2000 and 2016, wherein GDP grew by a compounded annual growth rate of 10.4%, while exports grew only 4%. Sri Lanka's economic growth during the past has mainly been generated, during the recent past, has mainly been generated by the expansion of domestic demand rather than increased exports. The tradable goods sector, that's imports and exports as a percent of GDP, declined from nearly 80% to 45% of GDP. 
from 2005 to 2015. You simply have a small open economy, you simply cannot do that. That is what has led to these debt problems and all the other difficulties that we are having. When compared with regional peers and competitors, Sri Lanka's export performance has lagged behind significantly. The export value index presented by the World Bank shows the extent to which Sri Lanka's export sector has been lagging in comparison to its regional counterparts during the period from 2000 to 2015. Sri Lanka has only increased its exports by 1.9 1, by 1 times in that period, 2000 to 2015, while Vietnam and Bangladesh have increased by 11.2 times and 5.1 times respectively. Even South Korea and Thailand, which have off much higher basis, um, they increased their exports by 3.1 times, uh, um, whereas we, as I said, were only 1.9. So this is clearly uh, not, as I think uh, your chairman-elect has pointed out, we have not had a stellar performance as far as exports is concerned. A key weakness in Sri Lanka's export structure is the lack of diversity in products and markets, as we've heard just now, as well as low complexity in the export basket. Exports continue to be concentrated on two traditional products, namely garments and tea, which account for more than half of total exports. The export sector shows a lack of diversification in terms of markets. Europe and the USA continue to account for over half of total exports. Further, approximately 70% of tea exports are to the Middle East and the Commonwealth of Independent States, where demand is sensitive to oil prices, which have been transformed by the shale revolution. The absence of effective trade finance has also contributed to the subdued performance in exports. At present, despite the share of industrial exports being around 77% of total exports, it is estimated that high-tech exports account for less than 1% less than 1% of Sri Lanka's total manufactured exports. Improving this ratio entails investment in machinery technology and skilled labor. It is necessary for our exporters to compete in complex products that are more technologically advanced. We are no longer a, a low wage economy. Therefore, we need to invest in and be competitive in fairly complex export products if we are again to meet the aspirations of our people. Now there was, I think, a very legitimate question asked about labor. But if you get into higher value exports, you create jobs which will give attractive wages, which will then make it much more likely that people going to the Middle East, to Korea, to Italy, wherever they're going now, they would prefer to remain at home, simply because a lot of them go without their families, which leads to a lot of social problems as well. So it's a question really of relative wages. If we can create jobs, higher paying jobs, and they, the jobs in the export sector tend to be higher paying, particularly if you are supported by FDI as well. That's the labor problem. There is not a shortage of labor in this country. It's just that the labor is in the wrong places. We have 27% of our workforce in agriculture giving us 7% of GDP. Now, it's a politically difficult thing, but we need to move people from low productivity, low income agriculture to higher productivity, higher income activities like the export sector. We have 15% of our workforce in the public service, 1.5 million people. It increased from 700,000 in 2005 to 1.5 million. So, you know, this is, there is plenty of labor. We have to create the incentives and the types of jobs to get people into the competitive and modern sectors. And that's to do with wages. And so we need to get the investment to get higher value jobs. Penetrating global value chains and product, production sharing networks will also boot industrial exports. Intrafirm trade in Asia has been the most dynamic segment of the international trading system. Sri Lanka has had a minimal, minimal presence in these production networks. This has to be reversed for Sri Lanka to transform its export performance by leveraging its geographical location in Asia. I need to say something about location uh, at this point. A lot of people say, you know, you're talking about uh, uh, export-led growth, uh, FDI, etc., when the global economy is rather subdued. That this is a low growth, sluggish international trade environment we're in, and we are trying to say that we want to do an export-led growth model. 
The answer to those people, in my view, is that our location and our international relations trump the headwinds in the global economy. We are right in the middle of China's maritime silk route. We are 20 miles from the fastest growing large economy in the world and the five southern states of India are growing at 10% plus, have been for a number of years and the middle class is increasing dramatically. We also have excellent relations with the capital surplus countries of East and Southeast Asia, Japan, China, uh, Korea, even some of the ASEAN countries. So, and in, in, in Asia, you can leverage good, and the minister would know very well, you can leverage good government-government uh, relations to bring investment into your country. So, this, whatever is happening in the global economy, we can trump that with the advantage of location and with the advantage of the excellent international relations that we have. As Sri Lanka's per capita GDP continues to rise, the country will lose its competitiveness in terms of its labor costs as wages increase. As a result, Sri Lanka will not be able to compete in exporting labor-intensive, low-value products such as textiles and garments, tea and spices, since exporters with low wage costs such as Bangladesh, Cambodia and Vietnam will become more competitive. At present, Sri Lanka is not able to match the competitiveness of countries such as Malaysia and Thailand. Uh, so we are, we are kind of in a little bit of a limbo. You know, we find it difficult to compete on wages with the Bangladeshis, the Myanmar's, the Cambodia's, the Laos's, and we find it difficult to compete on productivity and competitiveness with the Malaysia's and the Thailand's. So we have to have a we have to absolute have an absolute laser-like focus on increasing productivity and competitiveness. That's where we have to move to uh, support our export drive. The modernization of the services sector is also important as the production flow process is now largely dominated by services. Service exports have increased rapidly since the end of the conflict with significant increases recorded in tourism, transport and ICT BPO. However, by transport I mean logistics as well. <laughs> However, Given the competitive advantages the country enjoys, particularly in relation to its location, there is great potential for further increase in services exports. Persistent large trade deficits which have become fundamental to a weakness in the balance of payments of Sri Lanka are a serious concern that needs to be addressed in the long-term interests of the country. The widening trade deficit indicates that comprehensive strategies which focus on promotion of high-value exports <coughs> expanding the export base and diversifying markets by strategically penetrating growing economies, particularly in Asia, are essential for the reduction in the current account deficit. I think clearly we need to protect, consolidate and if possible increase our markets, our traditional markets in the US and Europe. But the real delta, the increase, the, the kind of uh, exponential increase that we are looking for has to come from Asia, um, from India, from China, uh, from ASEAN, etc. And as we, as we know, uh, incomes are growing, markets are expanding in these countries. We need to get a, get, a part of that action, get a part of that action. Restoring external sector stability in a challenging environment requires the building up of external buffers with policies to reduce spillover effects from adverse developments in other areas. In this connection, priority has to be attached to fiscal sustainability and prudent monetary policies to ensure that excess demand is not pushed into the system. The generation of higher export revenue will, in turn, increase the capacity to service the accumulated stock of foreign liabilities. It can also be utilized for the stabilization of the exchange rate and the building up of a sustainable level of reserves, which will help to increase the country's economic resilience. In addition, a renewed focus on exports can help divert investments to more efficient sectors of the economy, thus raising overall productivity. This is what I was saying, to shift people and financial resources to more productive sectors of the economy. Growth in exports also entails several other benefits, such as the creation of an efficient price mechanism, inflow of new technology, employment creation, greater economies of scale, and expansion of the productive resource base of the country. In the last decade, increasing reliance on unsustainable levels of foreign borrowing was an inevitable consequence of growth which was dependent on non-tradable goods and domestic demand. That's what I was trying to say earlier. If you go for an inward-looking growth strategy, um, as we did in the, uh, in the last 10, 12 years, inevitably you will run into the difficulty we've done. We've had, because we've had to borrow 
to invest. And we haven't created the capacity to earn the foreign exchange to service that debt. Because we've depended on domestic demand and the non-tradable sector. The country requires a growth process which is driven by a surplus in the current account of the balance of payments. In the past, we have experienced top growth growth, growth supported by unsustainable by the deficit. If you look at our growth performance, and you correlate it with the size of the budget deficit, all the high growth years, you get high budget deficits. So how we, we create growth by pumping money into the system through large fiscal deficits, which then create growth, which is just not sustainable because it, it's not productive. It essentially is driven mainly by consumption. You, you have, uh, we tend to keep our interest rates low, keep the exchange rate overvalued, so people borrow and import and you immediately run into balance of payments problems. So it's just not sustainable. After a couple of years, you have a balance of payments problem and also the pumping money into the system creates inflation. So you, if you look at the last 30, 40 years, you get repeating cycles of stock growth policies. So the trick is to attack the budget deficit, which is crucial. And if you're able to do that, then other things fall into place. Now the government has taken several measures uh, to recently to boost exports. In terms of institutional support, by recognizing the need for broad-based institutional support, the government has already taken steps to create the Agency for International Trade. The FIT is taking the lead in negotiating a series of trade agreements and early harvest is being sought to increase the benefits from the existing FTA in goods with India. These include mutual recognition agreements among standard institutions and relaxing quotas on goods of interest to Sri Lanka. Negotiations are also underway to deepen and broaden the agreement in goods through adjustments to the negative list. The EDCA will also extend the application of negotiated rules for services, investment, training and technology. Similar agreements are being negotiated with China and Singapore. Now, there is a natural concern, natural nervousness about a small country like Sri Lanka negotiating um, trade agreements, partnership agreements with enormous countries like China and India. Now, we are not the first small country to negotiate uh, a trade agreement uh, with a large country. I mean, Mexico is not a small country, but it's, it's interesting that Mexico has benefited most from NAFTA, much more than the US or Canada, which is why Mr. Trump is crying foul and, and has all these stories about the Mexicans. So it shows that a small country, a smaller country, uh, by negotiating a trade agreement with a much more powerful uh, partner, can still benefit. For that to happen, the agreement has to be based on two principles. One is the principle of non-reciprocity, that is the larger country has to do much more than the smaller country, and two, special and differential treatment in terms of the phasing in of the, uh, the liberalization, etc. So you, you build in mechanisms which take into account the asymmetry in the economies uh, which are negotiating these agreements. Now both China and India recognize the principles of non-reciprocity and special and differential treatment. Their negative list will be much shorter than ours. Their positive list will be much longer than ours. They will allow us, I'm sure, to negotiate safeguard agreements. These mean that if you have a sudden surge in imports, if say imports, you can, you can pick a norm, imports go up by 10%, 15% over a particular period of time, you can automatically put in place tariffs. That's a well, well used uh, practice. So that gives you protection as a small country against these import surges from larger countries. Equally, you can negotiate good dispute resolution mechanisms, which gives you a chance to address uh, your issues uh, which come up in dealing with the larger countries. So there are these mechanisms, well tried and tested mechanisms, which can be used uh, for us to ensure that we get a good deal. Our trade negotiators are well aware, aware of these things, and I'm sure they will negotiate decent deals. Now in addition to all these, to the deals uh, that are being negotiated with India, China and uh, Singapore, we have the bilateral FTA with the Pakistan, uh, which is being invigorated. Uh, and on top of that, of course, we have GSP+. Plus. Now, if you take all this together, if we are able to conclude these trade negotiations successfully, Sri Lanka could have access, preferential access, to a market of 3 billion people. 
which is a massive USP. Now, I think Singapore has access to both China and India, preferential access, but they don't have preferential access to EU. So there is no other country in the world that I know of which has preferential access to China, India, and Europe. I know the EU uh, GSP Plus is only for four years, but four years is enough time for us to take advantage of, of that. So that, I mean, it's a massive opportunity. Now, of course, this market is of three billion people is going to provide opportunities for our own exporters. But on top of that, the trick is to use this access, preferential access to this market, to leverage the trade investment nexus. To tell people you can come and locate here and sell on a preferential basis to China, India, and Europe. I mean, that is a massive, massive uh, narrative, uh, massive, ma massively attractive narrative that one can offer uh, potential investors from all over the world. Um, now, that's, if I may talk about some of the policy support, uh, national export strategy, I, I, my colleagues here from the EDB are here, who know a lot more about it than I do, uh, but the EDB has initiated a national export strategy, <coughs> which as you know, <coughs> is a co collaborative effort between the government and the private sector, and it provides a five-year action-oriented framework for the development of trade and competitiveness. Simul simultaneously, a national trade policy has now been drafted. Uh, it's, a, it's a very neat, I don't know how many of you have seen it, but it's a very neat 20-page document, very tightly and coherently drafted. And for the first time, we have formulated in this concise way the country's trade policy, which I, for me I, it was, is actually very well presented. An anti-dumping bill is also in, 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 in Parliament. It's clearly important if we're going to open up some sectors as part of the trade uh, uh, agreements. Uh, and the government is also working out a trade adjustment package with the help of the World Bank and the International Trade Center in Geneva. And what that intends to do is to assist companies which are going to be affected by the liberalization uh, to become more competitive and also to assist workers who have, uh, who have, uh, whose jobs have been threatened uh, to retrain. Now, I've talked about the macroeconomic policies. Uh, I think I've talked about uh, the log logistics improvements. SMEs in export promotion. I think here, um, you know, off, we've had many, many initiatives to support SMEs. There are four areas that uh, they require support in. One is training, two uh, is, is inputs, including technology, three is access to finance, and four is marketing. Invariably, the biggest challenge is marketing, to get them to produce stuff which they can sell, and whether it's in the domestic market or abroad. So one challenge is really how we link our SMEs into international supply chains, either through larger companies or directly, we really need to think in terms of linking up our SMEs to the uh, to supply chains. I think the innovation and R and D have been spoken of. Uh, I'm not going to I've already run over my time, so let me uh, quickly summarize. Uh, the government has already taken some decisive measures to overcome the shortcomings of the export sector. With some improvement in the performance in the export sector, so far there are some signs that the initiatives are beginning to pay off. Since March, we've now seen an improvement in export numbers. Uh, for the last, we've got numbers up to May. March, April, and May, the numbers have shown an upturn in uh, export revenue. Hopefully, that will gather momentum. I think with the GSP Plus kicking in, uh, uh, and hopefully, a more stable macro environment, we will have got that will gather momentum. As I said, Sri Lanka cannot attain six to seven percent growth on a sustained basis without transformation of its export performance. Nor can we overcome the constraints associated with our external debt burden without significantly enhanced non-debt creating foreign exchange receipts generated by increased export earnings. So the transformation, export transformation is crucial for both boosting growth and employment, as well as to stabilize our vulnerability stemming from our external debt dynamics. The performance of the EASL 
will be a key determinant of the future prosperity of all Sri Lankans. Thank you all very much.